So now let's get into some really detailed stuff, EU rose exemption updates, specifically the exemptions called out in annexes three and four. Okay. So there are exemptions to these limits. There are narrowly applied exemptions where it's just not technologically or economically feasible. An example is lead in resistors. There's lead in the glass matrix of resistors. It's very, very expensive to produce those without that. And so um, the industry has asked if they could have an exemption and they could allow to exceed the death threshold of lead if it's in the glass and resistors. That was provided under exemption 7C1. So we have these kind of narrowly applied exemptions that we can use so that we can exceed the thresholds. They're listed in annexes three and four of the regulation. Um, the problem is that these exemptions are not permanent. When they're defined, they're automatically given a expiration date, a sunset date. And depending on the type of product that it applies to, um, it might be five years or seven years. And it could also be some other number that's less than that if they choose to do so. So we have to track these expiration dates and make sure that none of the components or materials we use are claiming any expired exemptions because they were no longer compliant, right? So these validity periods are set by the commission when they define or publish the exemptions. So once these things are coming up on expiration, the industry is able to request the exemptions be renewed or extended beyond their original expiration date. That request must be submitted no later than 18 months before the uh, expiration date of the exemption. And once they're submitted, um, the exemption will remain in force until the commission publishes their decision on the renewal, right? So it basically just extends it out. Um, now, if they choose not to remove, once they review it and they choose not to renew it, they will still give you at least 12 months before it expires so that you have some time to react. Okay, so it's not like they're going to just cut you off on the day they decide, they're going to give you 12 more months. So what does this, what does this process look like? So um, we as an industry submit a request for a renewal on an exemption. Well, what happens then is that the commission goes and utilizes an external consulting firm to perform technical and scientific review. So they're going to look at, um, they're going to consult with the stakeholders, the, the industry associations, the companies, and say, hey, why are you wanting this extended? They're going to evaluate the technical information, review the stakeholder input, get back with the stakeholders to clarify. And then finally, they're going to issue a report that recommends whether to renew the exemption, to reject the renewal and cancel it, or maybe redefine that exemption in some narrower scope. Okay. So, and then once that recommendation recommendation has been made and they've provided the report. The commission will circulate that with the member states, they'll consult with the parliament, and then they'll make those kind of consultations publicly available. Then they'll draft a delegated directive, submit it to the World Trade Organization for review, which takes 60 days, and also publish it for public feedback in the Euro European system online. Once that's done, the delegated directive can then be adopted, a two-month scrutiny period commences, and then it will be published in the official journal. That's the process associated with this. It takes a very long time from when the renewals get hit, uh, get submitted to when they actually get uh, decisions published. In fact, we can see that with PAC 21, which was recently resolved and closed in February 4th, when um, the PAC 21 exemptions were finally um, published, all the renewals were published. And these exemptions were related to mercury used in lamps. And this is in response to renewal requests that were submitted in 2015 and 2016. And here we are in 2022. So it gives you an idea how long you can expect when you submit a renewal request for that to take, right? And so we can see there's three different types of actions that they're gonna take on each one of these exemptions. They're gonna renew them without changes. They're gonna say, okay, we're gonna extend this and give it a new date. They're gonna make some minor changes to it, or they're going to completely rescope it into new exemptions and kind of narrow it down. So um, obviously renewed without changes is basically the simple. They just change the expiration date and move on with their lives. Renewed with changes can mean different things. Like in the example of 3A, what we see here is when they renewed this exemption, they added some wording to there. They said that, yeah, we're going to renew this exemption up until, um, uh, you know, a certain date, but um, we're only going to renew it for bulbs that were made to be used in lamps that were placed on the market before February 2022. In, in other words, for replacement bulbs going into previous lamps, you can go ahead and have this substance present. For new lamps that are being placed on the market, you can't. So it's a way that they kind of narrowed the scope of the regulation or the scope of the exemption so that they didn't have to kill all the stock of everything and they could go ahead and continue to supply the products that need those bulbs. 
Now, on the other hand, when we look at 1F, this is something that was rescoped into brand new exemptions. So they took 1F and they created 1F1 and 1F2 so that they could divide up the expiration dates between special lamps and ultraviolet spectrum lamps. So they decided the ultraviolet lamps needed more time before their exemption expired than the regular lamps that this applies to. So they broke it up into two separate exemptions, right? So 1F, which was slated to expire in July, 20, in July of 2016, has been replaced by 1F1 and 1F2, and those will expire in 2025 and 2027. So you can see how we need to be aware that the, the way that they address these is not just renew or deny, but a lot of times they redefine. And when you look at the reports associated with the PAC-22, you can see that that's the case. So what happened is that PAC-22 is the one we all care about. It's probably the reason most of the people are here listening to me talk today. PAC-22 contains all the uh, exemptions that were set to expire in 2021, so July of 2021. These are the exemptions that are heavily used. 6A, 6B, 6C, 7A, 7C1, 7C2. 7A, high melting point solder, and 7C1, lead and electronic components, uh, used almost exclusively in, in many, 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 many products, right? 6C is also a big one, used everywhere. So industry is kind of waiting to find out what's going to happen here. So we know the process involved is they have to go to the consultants, the consultants make the recommendations, issue a report. Well, that report has been issued. The report was issued in January and then updated or, or revised in February. And so now we have the exemption uh, recommendations that we can view. We don't know if the commission will take those recommendations. They don't always adopt them exactly as recommended by the consultants, uh, but at least we have an idea of what they're considering to adopt. So we can take a look and make sure that we don't have any gaps in compliance as a result of this redefinition, right? Now, keep in mind that even though they've made these recommendations, the original exemptions are still in force, sunset dates for those are no longer valid, and that will be the case until the commission publishes their final decisions, right? And even if they decide not to extend these, we'll still get a six-month grace period before they expire. So let's look at this then. What kind of things are we looking at here? And I apologize for the small type. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of info here. You will get copies of the slides. So if you look at, for example, 6A and 6A1, um, they've decided to break this up in the 6A, 6A1, and 6A2, allowing 6A to expire in 2023 and 2024 for medical devices, but allowing 6A1 and 6A2 to replace it for other categories that expire in 2024 and 2026, respectively, depending on whether it's galvanized steel or machining purposes. So now we've seen a situation where we've taken one exemption that applied to two applications and they've broken it apart into separate sub exemptions so they could give each of those applications a different expiration date. Similar things were done with 6B and 6B1 and 6B2. But when we look at 6C, we can see that 6C was simply renewed, no changes. There was no changes at all to the, the exemption definition. They simply extended it to 2026, or at least they're recommending that, right? So now we can get a view of what we can expect to see if the commission adopts the recommendations, and we can do our analysis to see where our, uh, our risks lie. When we look at 7A, we can see that that has also been done here. So what they've done is they decided, as you can see here, we're going to recommend extending the 7A, the high melting point solder exemption, until July of 2024. And then after that, reduce it to only certain applications, which they've listed here. Um, for example, internal connections for attaching the die, et cetera, solder ball attachment to, to BGAs. So they've said, okay, we can use it as is until 2024, and then we're going to lower the scope down to these individual applications until 2026. Right? So that's their way of kind of starting to creep the scope back down on these. 7C1, they've done the same kind of thing. We'll extend that to 2024, and then we're going to only let you claim that for certain specific applications moving forward, right? And so you can kind of see that that uh, uh, is something that we need to track. And so I could look at this now and say, okay, well, here's the proposal. Are any of my products going to fall out of compliance in 2024 because they don't mean the 7C5 um, exemptions? Yes or no, right? So I have that ability to kind of see that. And it also gives component manufacturers the ability to let us know whether they claim 7C1, which means that will only be good to 2024, or whether they claim 7C5, which is going to be good until 2026 because it meets one of those uh, sub-definitions.
Learn more by viewing the full-length video online at greensofttech.com slash videos. Plus, learn about our environmental regulation solutions online at greensofttech.com.